person. I, I would love to come one day. So uh, uh, please keep that in mind. I'm going to be talking about the use of qualitative data for feedback and assessment. Um, and I'm happy to, I won't be able to look at the chat uh, while speaking, but if you have questions, you can put them in there and um, take a lot of questions at the end. So the reason I decided to focus on language and assessment was due to um, evaluations like this. So this was one from one of our residents at the end of an internal medicine rotation. Um, you can see that it starts out okay, good team player, enthusiastic and kind, good interpersonal skills. And then you read that the person has their knowledge level and ability to work up cases that's less than that of their peers. There's frequently major gaps in knowledge base, fails to take the initiative, tends to defer to others, et cetera. So what would you give this person if this was your assessment to complete. Here's the comments. There's the rating form at the, the scale at the bottom. And just unmute and shout out a number for a reason. Two. Needs improvement, too. Needs improvement, OK. Agreed. Needs improvement. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. What do you think they actually Agreed. got? Agreed. Needs improvement. Needs improvement. What do you think they actually got? Three. Yeah, they got to meet expectations because we seem to be just completely unable to use that left side of the scale. So this really bothered me that all that we had in our system was the need to have a three or above to pass the rotation. And the comments just didn't really matter, even though it looks like at least one evaluator put in a lot of thought into writing these comments showing what the resident needed to do next. So why does this happen? Well, I think in medicine, we're sort of enamored with numbers. We have always focused on numbers. They're attractive. They convey a sense of objectivity and precision. We're very used to numbers in science and medicine, but we also know that it's difficult to capture the entirety of a performance and reduce it to a single score. But the numbers on the other hand, <clears throat> can cap the comments on the other hand can capture something different. They're relatively unexplored in the literature, um, but we do know from the literature that they can actually capture a whole lot as we've seen that the scores don't. And we tend to sort of overvalue objectivity and undervalue subjectivity. And I think this has led us down a couple of bad paths. So when you look at the literature, we actually see that um, research on the use of comments and assessment goes back way into the early 90s. And comments have been shown to be useful for things like predicting future performance or the need for remediation. And this has been shown in studies, uh, medical students and residents and even practicing physicians. And I'll give you a couple of examples. A study by Cohen from 1993 looked at clerkship evaluations of medical students and they found that looking at the comments alone allowed them to pick up students in difficulty better and earlier than the scores did. But really nothing came of that. And Steve Durning and his group in 2010 did a study of about 1,500 um, end of rotation evaluation forms. And they found that there was a significant minority that were discordant, right? So like mostly you see positive comments with high scores and more negative comments with low scores. But there was this group in the middle, like the ones we saw, where there was a discordance. Um, and in all cases, the comments were thought to be more sensitive and sort of more accurate than what the score said. And similarly, in a huge study of GPs in the United Kingdom, found the same thing. And most, most were aligned, but there was this interesting minority where there was a disconnect. So this can be a really interesting area to explore, especially if we can show that the comments might be a little more sensitive than the scores. So a group of us actually started looking into even the validity of using qualitative data for assessment. And we wrote a couple of papers um, led by Dave Cook at the Mayo Clinic to look at how you can use qualitative data instead of just numbers in a validity um, to make a case for validity for the data. And we showed that you can do it with written comments just as well as you can do it with numbers. 
and I'm going to take a little sidetrack into validity for a minute because this will become important. So I'm not sure how many people would be familiar with the newer models of validity, but in the old days, people used to talk about and still sometimes talk about things like face validity, criterion, content validity. And then the field sort of moved on and we started talking about things like um, correlational validity and construct validity. Like what is it that you're purporting to measure? What is the construct of interest? And then that moved on to the sources of evidence. And this is where Messick's framework of validity comes into play. And you can look at the content, the response process, like the way the person interacts with the scale they're filling out, the internal structure, the relation to other variables, and then the consequences of the decision you're going to make based on that um, data. But we got really interested in Kane's framework for validity because it's framed as an argument to support a use. And what I mean by that is what Kane stresses is you have to know what you're going to use your data for before you start thinking about validity. So you have to state what he called the interpretation and use argument, and then you decide how much evidence you need to support that argument. So it's important to remember that a, a scale, an instrument, a measurement is never valid in and of itself. It's valid for a particular use, and you have to be clear about that. So for example, using um, an end of rotation rating form or a, a milestone or entrustment decision uh, tool, if you're using it for something very high stakes, you're going to have to really focus on pretty much all these things, scoring, generalization, extrapolation, but mostly implications of your decision. Whereas if you're using it for formative assessment or feedback, the implications inference doesn't have to be as strong. So you collect different types of evidence for what you're going to use your forms for. So this will come back. So I've given you some evidence that the comments can actually be quite useful for predicting the need for remediation and other things. But there's an equal, if not more, number of articles that just talk about that comments are too vague to be helpful. They're generic. You get things like that lie article from 2001. The article was called a pleasure to work with and the word pleasure or pleasant to work with was in like almost all of their evaluations. And in that article, the authors were dismayed that the majority of the comments in their words were not about clinical skills, but about things like attitude and communication. And, you know, back in 2001, they didn't really think those were too important. We know better now but they were very concerned that the comments were just very vague and generic and you couldn't tell students apart. And research since then has also critiqued the comments as just being not actionable and, um, and not specific enough to be helpful. But again, in the back of your mind, you should be thinking about helpful for whom, right? The other issue is what do the words mean? And it turns out that words are subject to a lot of interpretation. And some people have done some really interesting research looking at what the words mean. So the Kiefer study mentioned on the slide looked at what used to be called Dean's letters now, like the, I think they're called MSPE. And the word good was only used in about a third of the school's letters. And when they ever used the word good, it was reserved for like the bottom third of the class. So the word good is actually a code word for below average. It literally meant you were in the lower half or lower third of the class. And there's other articles like the other study mentioned um, that looking at the MSPE categories across a number of schools, this was all I think applications to something like radiology. When the word excellent was one of the scale points, it was never the top. There was always something better than excellent. And so you could be excellent and be in the bottom half of the class and none of the schools used excellent as their best marker. So you get this sense that good doesn't really mean good and excellent doesn't really mean excellent, especially if there's something better. So I really started to wonder why the evidence was so mixed, right? Like on the one hand, uh, you have comments, studies showing that comments can be really useful, but on the other hand, there's studies showing that they're really useless. 
So I started exploring this in my PhD and I did a series of studies and I'll show you a few of them and, um, and we'll see what we think. So here's another little bit of audience participation. These are all comments from one uh, first year resident in internal medicine. This was about six of the comment boxes out of the 12 rotations he had that year. And um, wh what do you notice? Again, just unmute. There are quite a lot of comments on work ethic. Okay, good. What do you think of those? Do you see those often? Yeah, we really like to comment on people's hard work and their work ethic. What else? <clears throat> Very specific about this person. You know, being, being good to work with is something that you can say about anybody. Right, right. But yeah, I, so Some of the comments don't say really anything at all, right? But they're also very variable. We go from outstanding to good to just like meh. So it's like, I feel like the range is very wide. Mm -hmm. So what do you think that says about this resident? Either, either the resident really does have variable performance or the different evaluators look at <clears throat> them very differently. Mm -hmm. well, we solid comes up a couple of times. Yeah. And what does the word solid mean to you? Well, in, in this context, I, I interpret it as mediocre. Yeah. You know, Why? they're, they're doing what they should be doing. Yeah. So they're okay, but not outstanding. Exactly. Okay. Better than saying satisfactory. Yes. Adequate. <laughs> I love these words. So, um, this was a kind of data that we had and we compiled, um, a hundreds of these over uh, our, from, from our actual residents. We anonymized them. You can see we took out their names and put in X's. Um, we also, we decided at that point that we were going to blind gender for a number of reasons. We weren't sure if it was going to affect the results, but we, we basically gave them all these comments and we asked different um, faculty members to read through and sort the comments from best resident to worst resident. And it turns out that it's really reliable. It was far more reliable than sorting out residents by their numeric scores, because I don't know, maybe you guys are better than us, but in our internal medicine program, almost everyone just gets a four or five on our five point scale. So there's almost no differentiation. But with the comments, it was really reliable. And we could do it with far less data. We did one study that showed that even with only three or four months of data, you could reliably sort your residents. So then we wondered, how could people do that? Because we've seen the comments are kind of all over the place. Some of them really don't say anything at all. And there's a lot of variability. And what we found is that people really read between the lines, like whoever said, oh, you see that word solid. And this is that thing that we heard from participants is that they still use a lot of those words, excellent, outstanding. But you could read through the lines that some of them aren't the ones that stand out. One of them said, um, on the face of it, words like very good, solid, at level, can all look good and solid and at level, but actually mean below level needs work. And another one said, met expectations, ironically enough, really means below expectations. And in mm -hmm. fact, numerically, we see this as well, is that almost no one gets that three of meets expectations. But they really struggled to understand and read between the lines. So even though they could do it with reliability, they didn't do it easily. And one of the things that really um, bothered them is they wanted to know who wrote what. So they want to know, is this a person that always writes this way? Do they just write pleasant and hardworking for everyone? <clears throat> In which case, maybe the comments are saying more about the person than wrote, that wrote it than the person who received it. One of our participants said, there's so much variability in the way that people write comments. Some people always write in areas for improvement in every comment they do, but it could make that resident look bad, especially if 90% of other people aren't writing areas of improvement. So you don't really know and you don't know how much weight to place on it. Another thing that was important was the timing and trajectory. So are the comments getting better as the year goes on or are they getting worse? 
or not changing, and what does that mean? And also people placed different interpretations, whether they knew a comment was from July versus in May or June, so giving more slack at the beginning of the year. What was really interesting is that verbs indicating change, like improving, developing, evolving, um, could imply something positive or negative. So one of our participants was looking at a comment that said, demonstrated tremendous growth. And they said, it's a positive because it shows that the resident was able to respond to feedback. But at the same time, it suggests that their performance wasn't very good to start with, and that's why they had to show the tremendous growth. So they wanted to give the resident credit for that, but they had in the back of their mind, why did you have to tell me how much they improved? What are you trying to signal with that? And in a subsequent study, we found that people really struggled. They wanted to know who wrote it and, and what kind of attending they were. Is this someone that just does two weeks a year or is this one of those hardcore internal medicine attendings that does this all the time? And maybe that has more credibility. But they also wondered about the audience. Are the comments written for the resident or are they written for the program director or the competence committee? And this is entangled with the purpose. Is it meant to be feedback? Is it meant to be formative? Is it summative? And they even talked about how the very same language, the exact same sentences and phrases could mean something very different if it was on like an evaluation form versus if you read that same thing in a reference letter where everyone expects the language to be much stronger and um, positive. And they also struggled around the norms and culture, wondering if in certain places, certain phrases might be more common or have some kind of hidden meaning. And one person actually said, oh, I didn't really realize how other people wrote until I became a program director. And I used to write, you know, solid meets expectations all the time. And I thought those were really good comments. And then I realized that no one else was writing that. And then they felt bad that maybe they had disadvantaged their students by not knowing the culture. So to understand this whole area better, like how people make sense of language, we started looking at this branch of linguistics called pragmatics. And pragmatics deals with indirect non-literal language. So things like irony, sarcasm, metaphor, where to understand it, you sort of need to know who's speaking, to whom, for what purpose, what's their body language or tone of voice, and you can sort of put it together that they don't mean literally what they're saying. What's interesting is that's usually missing in the written comments. And within pragmatics, we got into this area called politeness theory. And politeness theory to me became really fascinating. We, we started looking at um, our comments this way. So I'll tell you a little about politeness theory. This posits that everyone has two aspects to face. So we all have a positive face, which is kind of our um, image that we wanna to project to the world. And some people call it, it's similar to self-esteem. The negative face is the desire to not be interfered with, so to move about the world with autonomy and independence. And I'll show you a classic example of someone losing face. Um, this is a visible reaction. Um, this is a, a little video clip of Meryl Streep, points at the end to who can name the movie, but this was the first time she was nominated for an Academy Award and everyone expected her to win. And this is just as they're reading out that she hasn't won. And you can literally see her face is falling. She's working really hard to smile and to keep it up. And this is affecting both positive and negative face. So her image as the up and coming new actor, but also we're really interfering by staring right at her while this is going on. So in what we're finding is that in the data, we see a lot of comments that people already brought up, like hardworking, work ethic, team player, pleasure to work with. Those are basic qualities that um, someone said, if you're a good person, you just get those comments. So we started thinking that maybe this was a way that attendings were writing about their residents by tending to positive face, those comments that just make you feel good. There's another aspect of politeness theory called conventional indirectness. 
And that is the use of phrases that by convention have come to take on meanings that are different than their literal meanings. So the way that we've said good and solid and meets expectations don't really mean what they say. So we looked in our data and we thought that this could be maybe one of the reasons why the comments are so vague. So what we did is we assembled um, a, a, an entire year's worth of comments and we looked at the difference between residents that were rated very high and residents that were rated low. And we found some really interesting politeness strategies. So one of the strategies which attends to that positive face or self image is called exaggerated interest. This is when we use um, really overblown language, double adjectives, exclamation points like absolutely outstanding or excellent resident in all aspects. And maybe not surprising, we found this in about 30% of the very highly rated residents, but only 2% of the residents that got like a three or below. So that one's maybe a little obvious, but there's another one called um, in-group identity markers. And that's when we use language like resident or clinician, consultant, that's basically letting someone know they're part of the in-group. And this we kind of do more subconsciously. And what we found is that this kind of language was present in about 60% of the high rated residents, but only about 30% of the low rated residents. So that was kind of interesting because it's not as obvious as like the exaggerated interest. This is the kind of thing we kind of do subconsciously. We're not really calling them residents or doctors as much. There's also the conventional indirectness, not a surprise. These words like good, solid, sound is another favorite, much more common in the lower rated resident. And then there's a category called hedging. And I'm not sure if the um, slide is showing up here, but this would be an example. This resident is actually already quite efficient at this stage of training. You can see that there's a lot of words in there that make you wonder how confident this person is about what they're saying. And in fact, hedging is a very common strategy. It was in almost all our evaluations, whether they were positive or negative. So we started really exploring this idea of hedging and why we do it. And the main way that we hedge is by the use of shields. So there's something called an attribution shield, which is where you basically remove yourself from the statement you're saying. You're attributing the belief to either someone else or to nobody at all. So the royal we is an example. And you say things like um, clearly or apparently, like it's not me, it's anyone could see this. So an example of that would be looked up to by juniors or um, no concerns no weakness is identified. We see that kind of passive phrasing a lot where it doesn't actually say who might have even observed these no weaknesses. And then the other kind of shield is called a plausibility shield where you're raising some doubt about whether or not you're fully committed to what you're saying. So we use words like um, probably or right now or as far as I can tell, here's a classic example. As far as I've been able to observe, and from the feedback I've received from others, X has a very good knowledge base and is a dependable senior. That's full of hedging. They're not saying this is a good resident. They're really kind of tiptoeing around it. Another way that we hedge, and it's a plausibility shield, is by anchoring it to the time of year. So we see comments like excellent knowledge base for level of training. This comes up a lot or an excellent July resident. And everyone kind of knows that what you're saying is, they started out okay, I'm not really confident where they're gonna go. So why do we hedge? We hedge a lot because assessment is a face-threatening act, right? And we're gonna walk through this a little bit. This is just a conceptual equation that came from the Brown and Levinson work on politeness. So there's always a relationship between two people. And the distance between them, the social distance, is a fairly symmetric relationship, whether you're close, like a best friend, or more distant, like a neighbor, or something like that. But the power relationship between two people is very asymmetrical. And whoever has the power in that setting has more ability to inflict a loss of face or to suffer from a loss of face. 
So when you have a great power differential, there's more potential for that to happen. So when we think about our assessment settings, I think our learners would probably say that we're the ones that have the power. We literally have the power. I mean, we're writing their evaluation forms and their assessments. And so there's a chance that they're going to lose face by not being the great medical student that they want to show. Um, and we're interfering with their negative, that negative aspect of face, which is the desire to be autonomous because we may actually hold back their training. We have power. But on the other hand, what we found from our studies is from the attendings point of view is we actually feel like the students have a lot of power as well. And it happens in a few different ways. One way is that they actually evaluate us. And so it does carry weight and can have um, significant effects, but it's also our, um, our own self image. You know, I wanna be seen as the kind, nurturing, supportive attending. I'm sure we've all had these experience where you sit down to try to give someone feedback and maybe they start crying or something and you just feel awful and you don't wanna be that person. And so the third element here is that R, which is the rank or degree of imposition. So it's basically in this context, how face threatening is this act? And that's also really interesting when you look at it in terms of culture, because some cultures, uh, for example, sports coaching and music and dance, they give feedback in public freely, uh, usually very corrective, uh, sometimes not very nice and it's just accepted. In our culture, it's really not very acceptable to give feedback. You would never give it in public. We always wanna to go to a quiet room and, and do that whole sort of dancing around it. So any sense of negative or constructive comments or feedback are very face threatening. And also we're a bunch of high achievers and we're used to doing well at things. So all of these things go together to make it easy to see why we would hedge so much and why we would work so hard to preserve face. So assessment is definitely a face-threatening act and it's culturally bound, but it's also essential, right? We don't want people walking around with terrible self-esteem or falling apart, and it smooths over social interactions. It does have implications for faculty development because the most of the articles that you will read that are about trying to train faculty to write better comments they have minimal to no effect or no lasting effect. And it may be because our default as human beings is to write nice, polite, hedgy comments. And it's just in our nature. So quick summary is we found that the narratives may be more reliable than the numbers and that people could actually read between the lines really well to decode these. But we also hedge a lot in our comments. But the issue is we also still stuck with this issue of having idiosyncrasies in our wording. And there's one final study I wanna draw your attention to. I noted earlier that when interpreting comments, the faculty and the residents that we studied, they really wanted to know who wrote what and they really struggled over wanting to know what the person's usual style was and whether they wrote this way for everybody. So we decided to do that study. And what we found was, here's a, a bit of the Excel file. We had um, thousands of comments from hundreds of faculty across four different sites. So you can see, similar to the comments I showed earlier, um, that there's variability. And you can't see it here, but the length of the comments, the wording, even whether or not people use the resident's name or if they're totally impersonalized, whether they're short form or numbered. So there's a lot of different um, styles. But if you actually then sort the file by attending, you see a different pattern, right? So this was a, a, a really aha moment, like someone that wrote uh, excellent knowledge base, clinically astute, caring and patient centered, literally for almost everyone they wrote for. And that phrase being clinically astute, you might think, wow, that must be some phenomenal resident. And then you go, no, that person writes that way for everybody. Um, another example was someone that wrote numbered lists so that they had strengths in one, two, three, four, five, and then they had another section for areas to improve. And if you didn't know that, you would think, oh my gosh, they wrote five areas to improve for everybody. And it's like, yes, they do that for everybody. So what we did is we took a database of, I think it was 
yeah, about 7,000 different um, in training evaluation forms from uh, nearly 500 attendings. And we found that using this program called the LUC, which is the Linguistic Index and Word Count, it sort of analyzes language um, using software for things like um, uh, parts of speech and action words and things like that. And what we found is that you can tell people apart. And um, if you had at least eight ratings per person, and the things that really counted were things like word count and sentence length. So that's kind of structural way that people write. And people were more easy to separate from each other. The more they used long words, um, something called clout, so writing with a sense of authority, analytic words where they're comparing and contrasting and cognitive process words, that kind of separated out the attendings. But they were really very similar in the use of tone because we all write very sort of positive comments. As an aside, we tried to do this on teacher evaluation forms and they're not so positive. Um, but there is no relationship to things like faculty uh, rank, experience, gender, resident gender, anything like that. So it really seems to be idiosyncratic. And these idiosyncrasies matter. Um, we found that there was some really interesting research even from areas like Amazon ratings and dating websites and selling things on eBay where people have analyzed language and find that people who use more words and longer words and who write with more authority are rated as more credible. They get more dates, they sell more products. And so supervisors who use more and longer words and who write with more authority may actually be taken with more credibility and more seriousness than other attendings who don't write as well. And it's possible that we're overweighting the language based on how someone writes versus what they say. And so that issue may be amplified when you have, as we've seen data from multiple sources that may be quite disparate from each other, we're gonna rate the comments that write more and write with more authority. And it's similar to thinking about in the quantitative world where we have people that are hawks and people that are doves. Um, we probably have similar things in our comments but we haven't really sorted out those kinds of profiles. So I'm gonna go back to the validity argument and I just have a couple of slides left before we go into questions, is to think about what is the intended use of all these comments. And the thing is that we really have a habit of conflating feedback with assessment. And I think this has been a problem in a lot of these studies. What works really well for one might not work well for the other. So feedback requires words that help the learner and their future supervisors know what they're supposed to focus on, what developmental goals there are, and what steps should be taken to reach those goals. But those are not typically features of assessment, and that assessment language focuses on summations and judgments for decision making. So decision makers need words that allow them to understand learner performance so they can make a trustworthy decision. But learners need words that are tailored to their developmental trajectory and to support their improvement. And so words can do both, but maybe it's not realistic to consider that the same words can do both at the same time. And most of the studies that are written either for or against written comments really flip back and forth in their language between feedback and assessment. And so we're really risking muddying the waters when it comes to our research and understanding and our use. And um, in an article that I wrote with Chris Watley a couple of years ago, we were started to be concerned that we talk about formative and summative, but even the term formative assessment is problematic because as soon as a learner hears the word assessment, it implies judgment and consequences. And so we ended up writing a, another piece that's gonna be coming out in academic medicine soon about what numbers and words can do. And we argued that numbers encapsulate and give you a nice shorthand for a performance, but you need words to elaborate that performance. And you need them both, but maybe for different reasons. And there are clearly issues of potentially um, fairness, uh, implicit bias, and other things that we have to pay attention to, but we probably do need both. And what, um, what we still don't know and what we still need to work on, there's a lot of areas that are still unclear. 
So we haven't yet grappled with uh, the middle point there. How do you use the comments efficiently? In our setting now, um, we're starting to use more programmatic assessment and we're collecting entrustable professional activities. And so people will come in not with 12 rotation forms, but like with dozens or hundreds of um, EPAs that all have narrative data on them. And we need to decide what the benefits and unintended effects are of using the narrative comments for decision making and reporting versus using them for feedback. And I think we also need to think about how we embrace and make use of the expert subjectivity that we all have without compounding things like implicit bias and all those articles showing that um, the words we use in things like uh, reference letters and promotion and tenure packages can really differ by gender and emphasize different qualities. How do we make sure we're not doing that in our assessments as well? So I think I'm gonna stop there. Um, I have lost track of, no, I think it's quarter two. So I, I actually made it in, in the 45 minutes. And so I think we have lots of time for um, discussion. Should I turn off my screen share? Yes, you can stop the share now. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Karani had to step out. So she asked oh. me to uh, take over here. I wanna first thank Dr. Ginsburg for this fascinating talk. I found it extremely interesting. We're gonna open up for questions. Uh, I can see everyone who has their screen on. So if you would raise So I have your to hand. say, I love the comment about Meryl Streep. She did <laughs> win eventually, but she was nominated a lot of times. That was for, it might have been the French Lieutenant's Woman. Oh, I got that one right. <laughs> did you? And I think yeah. she lost to Catherine Hepburn for On Golden Pond, which I still haven't seen. So okay. <laughs> how should we take questions? Should we With look? that. If you raise your hand, I'll call, I'll, I'll play master of ceremonies here. So you can just worry about Thank you. Ask. So if, I, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. Dr. Sakar. Good. Um, I find that one of the most useful things to give a recommendation letter clout or something is to be sure that it's unique to the individual that, that the, uh, the adjectives, the adverbs, the phrases, the characteristics you point out are very unique and specific uh, to that individual rather than something that can be applied generally uh, across the board. And that concrete examples of specific accomplishments like uh, um, you know, uh, extended a differential diagnosis and made a, mm -hmm. a, a special diagnosis or uh, researched the literature and came up with a, an article that showed why this treatment is better than that treatment or was resourceful and took the initiative in getting an IRB approval without requiring mm -hmm. a lot of supervision. Mm -hmm. um, so that while we talked a lot about or actually we talked some about distinguishing the evaluator from other evaluators. My own view is, is the more important thing is to distinguish the student from yeah. other students. No, I, I agree. And letters of reference are, are a, a different genre, but very um, obviously important, maybe even more important to students and residents than what's on their evaluation forms because the reference letters help them get to that next stage in their training. And um, it's interesting that in the data we have from our studies, not only did that help it, so, so the more specific the language was, the more credibility people gave to that comment because it felt like the person really must have known that learner to have written such specific comments. And from the learner's perspective, they felt like it showed that the attending really cared about you if they took the time to write something specific. So it has all kinds of positive effects. So thank you for bringing that up. Do you think there's any differences in the way that Canadians and Americans or people from different regions yeah. or cultures yeah, uh, so structure their feedback? 
Yeah, that's a good question too. In our in our large data set, um, with the looking at the at Raiders idiosyncrasies, that was actually included a U.S. school and three Canadian schools from across the country. And actually, I did my PhD at the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands, and uh, they struggled a little bit with the politeness theory. I, at my defense, I'll still have like, you know, nightmares about this, but they. <laughs> they use language in a different way. They're more direct. Um, they mm -hmm. use a lot less hedging, less adjectives. And so clearly these things are not universal. And we've also found in some of our studies and whenever I've presented these locally, people that have come, because Toronto is a very, um, uh, there's a lot of immigration into Toronto and to the University of Toronto. And we have attendings that have come in to our system where they've trained in you know, Ireland or Finland or whatever and they write these very honest, direct assessments and the residents cry and complain about them and they get terrible teaching <laughs> evaluations. And one of them said they had to learn how to Canadianize their language. So yeah, there are definitely cultural differences. I do see a couple of other hands up. Yes, um, uh, Joel. Hi, sorry, I'm, my computer is having trouble, so I'm trying to work on a phone today. It feels very strange. Um, thank you for such a great talk. I just had one comment. In the beginning of your talk, you, um, you showed a lot of scales and, the, and how the, the numerical scales weren't very helpful, but they used a lot of generic terms and not direct objective anchors on those scales. And I'm sure you're aware that um, the Milestones Project that came out of pediatrics, and I think is in other GME areas, provides much more objective anchors and our evaluations as imperfect as they are have pretty concrete examples for each level on the scale. And we've tried to take the numbers out so you don't see the numbers when you're doing the scales. And although it's imperfect, it does divide, our residents do tend to be divided up. You tend to see a, a wider range, generally from two to four, it is a five point scale, um, uh, occasionally higher and certainly you do see people at the lower end now, since that change was made quite a number of years ago. It still requires constant ongoing faculty education and it is very imperfect, but um, those numbers are a little bit better than they used to be when it was just like anywhere from lousy to really great. Yeah, yeah, that we've seen that as well with the shift to the entrustment rating um, framework. Um, interesting, we had, a, we had that, um, when we first brought it out, the first scale that they had, we saw much more of a left shifting because there was like very gentle language, like not yet ready or whatever, like that sort of developmental language. And then they went and changed it and they made it much more like an eider form. And now everyone's back to getting mostly fours and fives. So I couldn't agree more that the language on these scales really matters. Uh, Alfred? <clears throat> Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, really, really appreciate it. Really great. Um, a lot to think about. One of the things whenever I think about this topic in, in, in general has been, um, and I put it into the comments during it so I wouldn't forget it, um, is this idea is, uh, do we do all this stuff because the, the people we're rating don't understand that we're not that we're doing them a disservice with this the shielding the really great keep it up you know just keep reading we'll get there type of comments that those those are just like we describe them here as literally saccharine for comments right no calories taste great no value um so you know could we do better by earlier on really teaching people what it means, teach the people who are going to get the comments, the lexicon and how we're doing a disservice so that they start to ask for more. Now, lots of stuff around that, but I'd love to hear, has anyone really looked at that or have you come across that thought before? Yeah, no, that's a great point. There's a, a group in um, Australia, um, Liz Malloy is one of the lead researchers and they talk about feedback literacy. So teaching the residents and students uh, what it means to receive feedback and how to receive feedback and the purpose of it. And they've shown um, improvements in how they actually engage with the feedback they receive once they understand better what the purpose is. And I think there are some places, I'm thinking again, it, it's one of the pediatrics programs where as part of their orientation, they basically tell their students, you're going to get a lot of threes at the beginning. And this is 
this is the norm for starting out and this is what you're working towards. So I agree, setting those expectations, not just of faculty, but of learners is very important. And, there, and there's evidence that it actually works. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Joy. So I, I know I teach in the basic sciences. I don't teach residents. So our evaluations are a little bit different. And I'm wondering if part of the, the reason it's so different is we have a very large number of people to evaluate, or approximately 150 at once, as opposed to maybe, I don't know, five or 10 residents. I also, uh, I know that when I evaluate a student who's doing an elective with me, where they may be the only student, and I am the only professor, it's a much more personal interaction. And you would mention that in your formula about, you know, the relationship mm -hmm. of a person and their power and their, you know, whether they're friends or not. Um, and I think all of these are, are really important things to consider. But the thing that popped out for the most part for me was that when we were doing our evaluations of our students on a five point scale, if you look at um, what is, passing in the course. And at the time it was not on standard deviations, it was on a percentage. Mm -hmm. And a student needed to score 70 to pass the course. Well, then the equivalent on the five point scale was a 3.5. That was a barely passing your evaluation on a five point scale, which meant that the average in our class, which was usually around somewhere between 83 and 85, was the equivalent of a four on that scale. Mm -hmm. So every student started out with a four because every student was considered average unless we peg them as being above average or below. Mm -hmm. So maybe 10 or 15% of the class got a five and maybe 5% of the class or 10% maybe got a three and no one ever got below that unless mm -hmm. we really had a problem with the student. But we already had a marker that we had to start with as average, which was already tipped to the high end of the scale just by default, because that's average. Right. And so, I mean, you bring up some really good points. And one is that um, there's nothing wrong with everyone getting, you know, entrustable or, you know, fully competent ratings if they are truly entrustable and fully competent. So the idea of like that you have to have a spread and you have to have lots of people across the scale, if you have an excellent group of, of trainees, they may truly all be excellent. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind. But when you start talking about averages, you're comparing people against each other. And we're really not supposed to be doing that anymore. We're supposed to be doing this, um, you know, more mastery level. If everyone gets mastery, everyone gets a five, you know, that's great. The problem is, is that we're not very, um, you know, we're, we're just not good at calling it out when it isn't excellent. And I think that's the problem. The ratings on the scale can help adjust people's expectations, like words like um, that, that imply more of a growth mindset and development are probably easier for people to stomach than ones that talk about competent or incompetent. And if I could just Sounds like up on that. <laughs> I wanted it to sounds add, like Lake Wobegon, where all the children mm -hmm. are above average. That's right, that's right. <laughs> if I could just follow up on that, what is the effect of an anonymous evaluation? Yeah. Because in, in some situations, you really can't give an anonymous evaluation because you're the only one. Yeah. But if there's a team that's teaching, you can, because it's mm -hmm. melded in with all the other evaluations. So that's a great point. So there's studies going back from um, the uniformed services um, medical school uh, back probably 20 years where they actually did that instead of asking people to do individual ratings where everyone was getting like their fours and fives on their clerks is they put them in a room um, at the end of the rotation and got them to talk about their residents or students and talk about their performance and what they observed and then someone would write all the comments down and they would actually end up with much richer comments and slightly lower scores but that were thought to be more accurate and it gave people that safety of, of that, that again, it's that attribution shield that you don't really know who said what, and it gave people that safety to be more forthcoming and honest. Great, we have time for one more question. Uh, Dan? Thank you for a really outstanding talk. 
I read an article in Academic Medicine, actually, uh, a couple of weeks ago, which really felt like a quantum leap for me in how I view feedback. Um, the article was titled something like feedback that helps trainees transition to unsupervised practice. I'm paraphrasing, but that was the idea. And the point that the article made is that among the many things that trainees need to learn clinically, professionally, you know, in, in a certain sense, they need to finish training with a very clear mental model of what high quality practice is. They need to understand what quote unquote good practice is. One, because that's the goal for all of us, but two, because that is the mental model they will take forward when they're practicing independently. And it's that mental model of what practice should always be that's gonna allow them to continually you know, reach for that goal and to self-correct and recognize when they're straying from good practice. And every to me now, every time a trainee is, is not performing the way they should be, um, there's the difference between where they, the way they should be and where they could be, I guess. But if we're just saying, if they're not meeting expectations and they're not performing in a way that's high quality, every time that that feedback doesn't get to them, it's, it's a missed opportunity to help them develop this crucial, crucial mental model that they have to come away from 100%. training with. Yeah, 100%. I think that's where, you know, our shift to competency-based medical education uh, really focuses on more direct observation and feedback in the moment. And that's what the system is built around. What we're finding though, is that people are getting a lot more observations and they're getting a lot more feedback, but because we have tethered that to documenting the feedback, we now have created, first of all, a ton of data that no one really knows what to do with, but also it makes even that informal uh, coaching kind of interaction feel like it has to be documented and it takes away from that nature of it. But I agree, we need to have more of those uh, almost zero stakes uh, feedback and coaching and role modeling opportunities that don't necessarily have to go into someone's dossier, but th that's probably where it's most effective. Great. I want to thank Dr. Ginsburg again for this excellent talk. I would like to remind everyone, Olga has put the uh, assessment form for this talk in the chat. Please complete that. 